So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. So Justin Smith is the Director of Financing Programs at Energy Efficiency Alberta. He oversees the design, delivery, and administration of organizations financing programs, as well as the industry's engagement with the financial services industry. Justin also serves as a strategic advisor to the Obama Foundation, supporting the organization's legislative redistricting advocacy program, as well as being a fellow with Alberta's Energy Futures Lab, an initiative recently named one of Canada's top 20 projects. For 2018, by Clean 50. So previously, he worked as Director of Policy, Research and Government Relations at the Calgary Chamber of Commerce and has worked in policy development and strategy communications planning with New York's Office of the Governor. And I guess he also worked with the New York State Senate. So let's give Justin a warm welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that introduction, and thank you for uh, agreeing to, to let me speak here. Um, really looking forward to engaging with you guys on, on some of the new programs that, that we're, uh, we're launching in the financing space uh, at EEA. Um, the first thing I'll say is really the, the, the premise for starting to construct and roll out financing programs goes to some of the market barriers that, that you and others in the energy efficiency and renewable energy space face on, on a regular basis. And, you know, EEA has been around for about uh, 18 months now, a little over 18 months, and we've had some phenomenal success in the series of programs that we've already launched in the residential, commercial, industrial, nonprofit space, um, whether it's on the renewable side or the energy efficiency side. Uh, lifetime energy savings captured on existing programs already have, 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 have exceeded $300 million in, in lifetime savings. So we've really seen, um, you know, the energy efficiency and renewable energy, small-scale renewable energy market kind of gain a foothold in Alberta over the last few years, which is really exciting. What you tend to see happen, however, um, is that rebates, incentive programs, and the like only get you so far and by themselves will not allow... Alberta to capture its entire energy efficiency and renewable energy potential. And if that's the objective, if, that, if that's really the target, what we've seen in other jurisdictions is how they supplement or complement a suite of rebate and incentive programs with strategically placed financing options that can really get your end consumer over the hump. When they can really, you know, see the value at the end of the day, whether it's a long payback period, whether it's a split incentive, whether it's some other market and impediment. If you can structure creative and innovative financing solutions to get them over the hump, you can capture even more savings. And so that's the intent behind the shift that we're making at EEA or, or the, the supplementation to our programming and, and, you know, as 2019 progresses, focusing on, uh, on financing programs. The first that we're rolling out, we're really happy to roll out this year, is the Green Loan Guarantee Program. So if you'd want to flip to the next slide. What this program is designed to do is serve as a credit enhancement for financial institutions and utilities that are currently offering financing solutions but could be doing more. So the government of Alberta has delegated or named Energy Efficiency Alberta to serve as the program administrator uh, that will strategically place $400 million uh, in the form of a credit facility to support additional lending in the energy efficiency, renewable energy, and clean technology space and really buy down interest rates or reduce uh, otherwise high underwriting standards that are being applied to these types of projects today in hopes of motivating additional lending. Now, this program, we're focusing specifically on commercial and industrial applications, so it doesn't touch residential at this point. Um, but uh, we really feel that uh, if we can secure strategic partnerships with financial institutions and utilities who are already in this marketplace, 
um, we can help motivate additional lending and get more projects off the drawing board and actually uh, into uh, into initiation stage, which is really exciting. So uh, if you flip to the next slide, I can go over some of the details around the program. The way that the $400 million has been parsed out is across three or four different categories, rather. So we have our small emitters class, which is less than $10,000 10,000 tons of CO2 emissions on an annual basis. So th these are either the savings that we can capture reflected in a ton of CO2 savings figure or um, um, uh, whatever the uh, offset of a renewable project or a, a, a distributed um, generation facility might be. This is essentially how we'd categorize that project. And with it comes a certain tranche of that 400 million as well as specific project caps. So what we're really trying to do is make sure that this credit enhancement or this credit facility uh, touches numerous projects across the province and across uh, different project sizes and types. We also have a $50 million tranche dedicated specifically to projects being initiated by indigenous communities in the province to really ensure that uh, they can participate as well uh, and, uh, and potentially see some of the financing costs that they're facing, uh, whether it's in the context of REP2, whether it's in a future uh, distributed generation auction uh, or, or other applications for renewable energy or energy efficiency bring down those overall financing costs and, and motivate more projects. Uh, next slide. So how it works is, uh, as I mentioned, the government of Alberta is backstopping the program. So the $400 million loan guarantee is actually quite effective in uh, bringing down financing costs, given the, 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 that we're covering 50% of, uh, it's basically an insurance policy in, in situations where financing were to enter into default. Uh, the full faith and credit of the Crown is securing those credit enhancement placements, uh, so it does have a fairly tangible effect on the financing costs that our participant faces at the end of the day. EEA administers that program, and what we do is actually enter into master program agreements with financial institutions or utilities running financing programs and place the credit enhancement through them. So if you are a project developer or a small business owner uh, that's looking to initiate a project like this, you could certainly come to EEA first and we will talk to you about the parameters of the program, uh, the terms and conditions of the program, various eligible projects that this program is available to. But by and large, the negotiation is going to happen between that individual project developer and their financial institution. And we're the one that works with their preferred financial institution, their preferred lender, to uh, uh, put the loan agreements in place, to put the loan guarantee in place, and uh, uh, hopefully buy down the terms of, of, of that financing or allow you to face underwriting criteria that uh, may be less scrutinizing or, or, or um, a little more accessible in terms of your, your position and, and the financial position of your enterprise and your project. Uh, next slide. So our, um, our goals for 2019-20, we're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. We, we've launched our application materials and information are already on our website, so I'd encourage everyone to check that out at, uh, um, I don't even know what the URL is, but you know, financing on our page, it's, it's right there on the masthead. Um, check it out, uh, the details are there. Uh, our goals for the program for 1920 are, are roughly $20 million in uh, loan guarantees that are actually placed, uh, leveraging $40 million in private sector investment for these types of projects. Uh, those are um, fairly modest goals. I think we'll shoot past that over the course of the 1920 fiscal year. Um, but we wanted to start small and really assess how, uh, uh, how impactful this credit facility would actually be in the marketplace and, and make program tweaks and adjustments um, as we go. But uh, we're really excited to move from the design phase and the building phase to the actual execution phase. Uh, we've already had strong market interest in the engagement that we've been doing, uh, both on the financial institution side, uh, specifically BDC, uh, ATB, and some others, uh, as well as the project developer side, whether it be solar, wind, uh, you know, large energy efficiency retrofits and commercial uh, applications. Uh, this seems to be hitting a sweet spot or, or, or a, a, a impediment in the market that our other programs haven't been successful at, at, at hitting. So uh, we really think that this complemented with, 
with our existing suite of rebate and incentive programs, uh, as well as our trade ally network and other market engagement activities, really start to, 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 to move the market and, and all achieve that market transformation that we're all, uh, we're all aiming for. So with that, I think I'll stop. Um, happy to entertain any questions that you might have at this preliminary point. Uh, and again, would encourage you to check out our website for any additional information. So thank you. So thank you, Justin. So Justin has to leave a bit early today, so we just want to take a few minutes for any questions, if there are any questions. Hi, Justin. My name is Jeff Collins. Um, question for you. Yeah. A um, couple of questions actually are tied together. What have you used as a model versus you know, other programs in North America or internationally to see how successful this project will be mm -hmm. with this initiative? I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, w when it's been implemented in other jurisdictions, mm -hmm. what kind of basis points have you seen in terms of improvement for projects to get funding? Mm -hmm. So you know, has it been 100, 200 basis points? You know, what, what have you seen on average for some of the benefit? The third part of the question, or whatever, is I see that the government is looking at allocating about 5% of the 400 million um, available in this first year. Is that correct? Because it's a $20 million of guarantee versus the 400 million total. Yeah, uh, and I'll just preface your question by saying that those are kind of internal targets sure. as a business unit. Okay. Um, if we kind of blow the doors off the joint and, and can really motivate okay. a lot of lending, we're happy to do that. Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah, I was just sharing. The, the scale at which we're kind of looking at things right now. Okay, so so the second part of your question around like the material change that this might have to financing mm -hmm. terms is a good one, uh, and it's something that is certainly jurisdiction jurisdiction specific. Mm -hmm. Um, and given that Alberta is a fairly kind of early adopter of even just the basic incentive and direct install programs, mm -hmm. not quite. We don't have the market intelligence we need to say with with any definitiveness or certainty what this will do to the interest rate that, that you're facing as a borrower. Mm -hmm. um, we have looked to similar credit enhancement programs in the United States. Uh, the Michigan Saves Program, yeah. the business program, had some really material uh, effect on, on the financing charges that, that folks were facing. We saw kind of 15 to 20 percent kind of reductions in the financing terms that they were facing, okay. uh, interest rates or, or the cost of capital that a project uh, developer is facing. What you often see first, uh, I would say, though, is a relaxation of some standard underwriting criteria. So if you know, a lender is asking for you know, um, you know, uh, five years' worth of financial statements or, or you know, uh, uh, a cash flow from, from you as a business operator, they might relax that to you know, maybe just the last few years. Or so really, this is addressing a lot of the underwriting criteria that loan makers usually have. Exactly. Maybe. So if you're, if you're sitting on the bubble, whether you, know, you're, you, you haven't you know, establish sufficient credit as a business enterprise, or if you're not able to put up as much collateral or security as a lender typically would want, mm -hmm. these are the types of criteria that we see relaxed a little bit with a program like this. Yeah. Then, when they gain some confidence with uh, the overall structure and, and the long-term returns of an energy efficiency or renewable energy project, that's when you start seeing uh, financial institutions get more comfortable mm -hmm. uh, with scoring these types of loans. Um, and 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 look to have uh, or look to, to offer their 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 um, their customers more competitive financing terms. Okay, I understand. So really, what this program is is a, it's a kickstart, um, and I think you're you're right. I, I work in the I've worked in the financial sector as mm -hmm. well, and so underwriting is important. Mm -hmm. um, but usually they look to experience, like mm -hmm. what what's the track record? Exactly. That takes time, though. Yeah. So, so there's a time element as well for this to evolve out so that you can get those real enhancement savings of, right. um, of some of the credit terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we see that in the efficiency you know, space a lot um, is, you know, there's so many different um, certifications and, and classes of buildings and technologies. And um, with those in, in the industry, whether you're in the construction sector, the clean energy sector, even the renewable sector, you, very uh, well versed in, in the long term viability and profitability of these technologies and their applications. But that good news story hasn't been effectively translated to uh, loan officers in typical financial institutions. They don't really see it as clearly, or they haven't had the, the same kind of market experience as market players do. A product like this that can give them the security they need to start doing more of these and maximizing deal flow will 
long term, it's our hope, give them the market intelligence they need to start issuing this type of financing without the backstop of, of a loan guarantee or a credit enhancement like this. And, and that's really the, the longer term objective. But I'd submit to your point that that, that will take some time. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. no, thank you. Appreciate the question. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you? Oh, this one? Or is it? Okay. Awesome. Yeah, these are just, again, internal accomplishments. Launched the program in December, uh, started some initial engagement with the, uh, the institutions listed there, uh, making sure that this is stackable with our existing rebate and incentive program. So what we're trying to do is capture folks who have come through those programs, who have maybe bought down their project costs by 15, 20, 25% through ver various programs, but are looking to finance the balance of that project uh, to make sure that they understand that the Green Loan Guarantee is an option for them. Um, and uh, uh, myself and uh, Stephanie, my wonderful colleague down here, are, are in the market now presenting this as a, as a solution. So uh, we're really excited about that. Yeah, question over here. Do you think it's a good fit for the market to be using financial institutions and utilities? What's the benefit of utilities being involved in this? So they're already in the space offering financing. Um, they come across applicants that don't necessarily meet their uh, lending threshold, um, but with a guarantee, um, they'd be more comfortable purveying that financing. Um, they have the customer relationship. They, uh, they are, they're doing some of the simple, straightforward underwriting already. Uh, so in a lot of ways, some of our utility partners are more ahead of the curve than our financial institutions when it comes to this type of lending. Um, and it made sense for us to look to them, or, or at least look to them, not restrict them from being a potentially qualified lender under the terms of the program. Um, you know, I list some of the institutions that we're talking with. We're still a bit of a ways there in terms of um, you know, finalizing an agreement and, and, and getting uh, the terms and conditions of our relationship and how this guarantee would be utilized. You know, we're still, I'd say, a few weeks away from, from that point. Um, this is just meant to signify that we've started some engagement with these folks and, and are looking to, to broaden that out. No, well, they're doing a lot of financing. They could do more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's good feedback. Can I ask, is there anyone in the room that would be interested in a product like this or is looking at a project that has faced barriers to, <laughs> to financing? That's great. Okay. So I'm going to leave a bunch of business cards that you guys can collect and, and talk to me. Yeah. No, so um, that decision was made kind of above us at the, the government level. Um, we're the administrator of the program, and, and the terms and conditions of this program, at least right now, are focused on the, the commercial and industrial space. Um, we're working uh, on another um, financing program called PACE Financing um, that's a little more applicable uh, to the residential space. Um, and we're, we're working with uh, partners, you know, municipalities and uh, our trade ally network to try and put in place a structure that, that might offer something like PACE financing to, to residential folks that are looking to, to, to make uh, uh, retrofits and upgrades of this nature. So um, that coupled with our home energy plan and some of our other supports to the residential sector, it was, it was sort of uh, felt that um, we had it covered off and, and we wanted to to at least stretch our legs with the commercial and industrial space first. That's not to say there won't be an evolution of this program, that we won't discover uh, gaps in how the market's being serviced currently and, and make tweaks down the road, but at least currently, it's just going to be for the commercial and industrial space. Just a real quick question before mm -hmm. you sneak out. You mentioned a figure, I think it was $315 million, right as a, as a precursor to before you began speaking, and I... The Can lifetime you, energy saving, yeah, yeah. Lifetime energy savings. Give, give me the context. I'm just oh, so it's uh, it's just a talking point. I should have thrown it out so quickly. But what it means is it's actually significant. Um, based on the 18 months of programming that we've had in market since the agency's founding, um, 
all of our programs, residential, commercial, industrial, uh, nonprofit, institutional, um, we've been able to secure through the, the retrofits and improvements and projects that we've completed, we've been able to secure well over $300 million in lifetime energy savings uh, with less than $100 million spent. So there's kind of a three to one um, ratio there in terms of the lifetime energy savings that we can capture through these types of programs, which is a very cost-effective way to bring down your overall electricity load and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Excellent. Thanks so much. Yeah. I got one more up here and maybe over here. Oh, man. I, <laughs> I don't know the URL. Isn't that pathetic? It's, if you Google Energy Efficiency Alberta on our masthead, it says financing. Uh, and there are a couple of our programs, the Clean Energy Improvement Program, as well as the Green Loan Guarantee Program, listed under there. And you'll find information on there. There's also a, uh, an email address that you can submit follow-up questions to and, and kind of dialogue with us that way. I think there was a question over here. Did you have a question? No? Any more questions? If not, last call. All right. Thank you, Justin. All right. No, thank you, everyone. really appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, Justin's going to leave us a couple of business cards, and then if you need it, just come up front, find me, and I'll pass it over to you. So our next speaker, David Kelly. So Dave entered the solar industry in 2001 when he installed a huge 600-watt solar photovoltaic system on his own home at a cost of approximately $30 per watt. Imagine that. He's a rich man. <laughs> the solar PV system on his roof was the third grid tied solar PV system in Alberta. He formed Skyfire Energy Inc. with Tim Schulhauser and David Von Esch in 2010. And Skyfire has designed and installed thousands of residential systems and many of the largest and most complex commercial photovoltaic systems throughout Western Canada. Think right now they have over 10 megawatt installed to date. So please join me in welcoming Dave Kelly. So hopefully my voice holds out. I had a horrible cold in October and did some damage to my throat. So, so I'm going to speak today about key considerations for commercial buildings. So what do we want to look at? What, what are the reasons for putting solar in a commercial building? So a lot of customers are looking for visibility. They want something solar in your face, demonstrating to the public that they have sort of this green bent to them, uh, drawing in that type of clientele. So showing leadership, inspiring others. Uh, energy production goals is the other one. So today, you know, back in 2001, it wasn't energy production. It was just kind of an interesting, geeky technology that I thought this would be kind of cool on my roof. But today, we can actually make an economic argument and deliver energy. So there's a number of programs that award points or, or, or pedals or whatever the program is. So we've got uh, net zero energy homes, we've got lead projects, we've got uh, living building, passive house, and all of these things take into account uh, the value of renewables or on-site generation of energy. So you get points for, for having solar on the rooftop. Um, passive solar design, uh, one of the first large projects we did was a 43.4 kilowatt project on the U of C, and I think, go back one slide. So you can see this building was the first lead platinum building in a cold climate. So the awnings not only provided energy uh, for the building, they provided shade for the windows, so reducing the air conditioning load. So we'll flip back. Um, utilizing high efficiency modules, so if you're looking uh, to maximize the energy production, so we're looking, how do we do that? Looking at things like high efficiency modules. Tremendous cost to some of the very, very high efficiency modules, uh, like SunPower, uh, looking four to five times the price of a conventional module. People are looking for energy production from a rooftop. So there's those considerations. What do you need? What are you looking for from your rooftop? Whether it's uh, aesthetics as well. So we can look at interesting architectural type solar. And then economics, looking at the lowest cost of energy, in which case we probably wouldn't be using high efficiency modules. We'd be using 
something to get us our lowest cost of energy, so levelized cost of energy from that system using you know, sort of a commodity module and looking at the balance between energy production and system cost, trying to minimize the cost going on. So a couple of examples. So this is the aesthetic solar. This is a PAW building, uh, Physical and Activities and Wellness Center in Edmonton. Uh, solar is a, an architectural feature. So those modules have no frames. They're transparent between the cells, creates neat light patterns in behind the array onto the building. There's windows behind it. And so there's that sort of project that people are looking for in addition to, to other considerations. We'll flip to the next side. Uh, this was lowest cost of energy. So fitted to the roof, we're not elevating for maximum performance. We're fitting for lowest cost of energy production. So covering as much as we can and following the curve of a, a curved roof out in the Fenland's rec center in Banff. So when you're looking at a building, num <coughs> sorry, number of considerations. So structural capacity of the roof and the building. So we've come across a number of projects where the roof was built prior to 1983-84, built to the old code. Snow loading has changed in subsequent code iterations. So buildings built prior to that time period may not have the structural capacity to put solar on the roof. They don't meet code today in order to put solar on them. You'd have to do a whole bunch of structural reinforcement. So that's kind of the first thing we look at. Solar access is the other one. I've got a slide at the end of the presentation kind of looking at solar access. Does, does the sun shine on the roof? Not every roof is going to be suitable. So if you're on the north side of a mountain, if you're behind a 40-story apartment building, solar may not work for your building. Existing roof membrane conditions. So if the roof's in horrible condition, it's 25, 30 years old, we've got bubbling, peeling, all kinds of things like that, you may want to re redo the roof first. Um, we generally won't go and put solar on a roof that's in poor condition because we will be the last guys on the roof and we will get the first phone call when the roof leaks. So looking at a, at a suitable roof uh, is a consideration when you're looking at putting solar. ARCA warranty, uh, the Alberta Roofing Contractors Association, their warranty program basically says it's almost impossible to put solar on a roof. They won't allow a ballasted rooftop mount. They want something with roof penetrations. They've told me roof penetrations are where all leaks happen. And you have to be at least four feet away from every roof penetration. So if you look at a roof penetration, where are you going to put solar? So it's challenging. Uh, we've managed to do it on a number of projects, but uh, it, it, it adds to the cost significantly. We've done a couple of projects now where it doubled the cost of solar in order to meet the ARCA warranty. So if you have an ARCA warranty on the roof, you may want to look at using the roof product manufacturer's warranty rather than an ARCA warranty. So there's a number of ways around that, or you can meet their requirements. Electrical service entrance, so when we look at the building, we have a certain limit on the solar we can add to an electrical panel or an electrical service. If you have a 100 kVA service, we can't put 200 kVA of solar or 200 kilowatts of solar into it. So there's a number of considerations as well. So we need to look at transformers, conductors, distribution panels, meter locations, etc. Wire service provider rate type and code, so depending on how the customer is billed, for their energy. Uh, some customers pay a very high demand charge based on their peak power consumption and a very low energy price. So in that case, if we can shave the peak, great, which may require batteries to guarantee that's gonna happen. We won't guarantee solar happens every day. We get cloudy days, we have snow cover. So you can't guarantee a peak shave on a system where you know, on, a, on a cloudy day, you may have your peak demand and get billed for that for the next month or year, depending on how that program works. And every, every customer is gonna have a different plan. So it's important to look at that. Minimum contract demand as well. Some customers have contracts with their retailer that says we will purchase a fixed minimum amount of energy every month. If you start adding solar, reducing their fixed or, or their minimum energy demand below that, they're still gonna have to pay for the energy to the, to the retailer. So there's some challenges around that as well. Safety, roof access, roof obstructions and setbacks. So if we've got lots of clutter on the roof and we've seen rooftops with you know, HVAC units all over the roof, uh, gas lines, uh, you name it, skylights, there's all kinds of things that could be on a rooftop that would limit how much solar you could place on the rooftop. So there's, there's considerations there. 
Uh, current energy consumption. So right now, under our microgeneration regulations in Alberta, we are limited to producing as much energy with the solar as the building uses in an annual basis. So we can't overproduce. You can do a little bit here and there, but uh, they're becoming more and more strict uh, and forcing customers to prove that they're going to use the amount of energy that we're going to deliver from the solar. Um, we've got one customer out in Bragg Creek has 43 kilowatts on his roof, told the retailer that he was going to add an electric car and switch to electric heat. Uh, he hasn't done those things yet, so he's kind of an anomaly in the province. Uh, he's actually gotten checks from the retailer uh, because he's overproducing to such an extent. Um, you can overproduce, and certainly you're welcome to apply under conventional distributed generation rules. Um, you would apply the same way as a 500 megawatt coal-fired power plant. You're probably 100 to 250 thousand dollars and a year's worth of studies and uh, costs. So it's generally not how we're seeing customers go ahead with projects. We're we're generally falling under the microgen reg regulations. Uh, I think there's one project in Alberta to date, one solar project to date that is under distributed regulations, and the rest are all under microgen, so behind the meter projects. Uh, we talked a little bit about minimum energy contracts as well. And so these are some of the building and electrical concerns that you need to look at when you're putting solar into a, into a building or considering solar for the building. So financing, Justin gave us some options here. So uh, they've just bumped the rates to 35% of system costs. It used to be 25% maximum for commercial buildings. Uh, it's capped at a million dollars. There's a federal capital cost allowance, class 43.1 and 43.2, generally not going to work on a, a commercial rooftop. It's for energy production companies. Talk to your accountant. Uh, you have to make an application to the CRA to find out if you're eligible. So it's not something that's guaranteed. Uh, banks are offering financing, obviously, as, as Justin spoke about. And a power purchase agreement is another way to do it. So if you look at a project uh, like the Brooks Solar Project, uh, it's distribution connected. They had a bit of financing, uh, $15 million from CCEMC back when it was our carbon tax distribution program. They've also been supported by a power purchase agreement. Somebody's purchased all of the energy from the project. So they've been able to guarantee a portion of their income from the power purchase agreement. They've had funding from C CCEMC. And there's a number of other projects in the province that are looking to go ahead with a power purchase agreement. So if you can find a customer interested in your energy from the solar project, then you can sell that energy through the Alberta grid. It's the only place in Canada that you can do that right now. So it's another option for building owners if you know the roof's not suitable and you want to have solar power, you can go to a number of companies, and I know Greengate is advertising now for power purchase agreement, um, where they're looking to build a large-scale solar farm somewhere, so it would be lower cost per watt for the project, and they would sell the energy through a PPA. So rather than having solar on your rooftop, you can have solar out in a field somewhere and use the Alberta grid to get it to your building. So a couple of other projects, uh, St. Albert uh, bus barns, so they've just purchased four BYD electric battery buses. They're effectively solar-powered buses now. So again, looking at how do you market that, how do you sell that to your customers, how do you create value for your customers, obviously it's got to pay for itself somewhere along the way. So low cost of energy, uh, get stored in the buses, and away you go. So looking to the future, <coughs> Solar access, so be careful with your assumptions. Um, looking at development guidelines around your building. And I've got an example coming up, political influences. We've got an election coming up. So I would suggest if you're thinking about solar, think about it before May. Uh, policy supports, regulations, uh, code changes uh, this year have made solar more difficult and more expensive to put in. Uh, building ownership, obviously, um, to participate in the EEA program, you have to have a long-term lease or, or some uh, ownership of the building. And future electricity prices. You know, everybody was always asking about payback on these things. If you can tell me what energy prices in Alberta are going to be in five years, ten years, we can give you a better indication of what paybacks will be. So it's a consideration, you know, where do you think energy prices are going to go? 
So another project up in Edmonton, uh, it's a 10 story building. We covered the entire south wall with solar. And then this happened. So there's gonna be three buildings on the east, south, and um, southeast corner of that location. And we won't have sun on the building until after lunchtime sometime. So we've lost half a day of energy production because of this solar access issue. Sites were not zoned for these tall buildings, 40-story uh, buildings. They were zoned for 10-story buildings. And uh, the city did a development change and allowed them to build 40-story buildings. So things to watch out for. <laughs> A little bit about Skyfire, uh, we're B Corp certified, um, we're core certified Tesla Powerwall installers and uh, obviously been members of CANSIA for quite a few years and uh, Solar Energy Society of Alberta as well. There's our facility, so we've got solar on our building as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dave. So I did. I forgot to mention that Dave has been a he has served a term on the CESA board and also four terms on the board for Kensia, uh, including one term as chairman. So he definitely knows what he's talking about. So in the interest of time, we're gonna, we're going to take questions at the end towards the end of the seminar. So let me introduce our next speaker. So Jeff. Uh, Jeff is the president of KCM Energy. So, founded in 2007, KCA, KCP has been doing solar since solar was cool. 11 years of solar and counting, Jeff still considered the favorite part of having a solar business is getting to work with great customers and a great team while installing a product that he truly believes in and just makes sense. Please join me in giving Jeff a warm welcome. Thank you, sir. All right, so I was uh, scrambling a little bit, I have to say there, as I was listening to David's presentation. I'm like, hmm, I better double check what my topic was. Um, <laughs> there's gonna be some overlap, I'll say that right now. But, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, what I'm gonna talk about is gonna be much more generalized and maybe more talking about the relationship between a solar installer and the business owner. So, in fact, I know that's what I'm going to try and talk about. So it will be a little bit different and certainly won't dive into the details like David did. Uh, maybe just before we start here, just curious. Um, I'm going to do this in a little bit different way than maybe might be intuitive. But of the group here, maybe uh, how many folks are involved in the solar industry? Can we see that with a show of hands? Okay. How many folks are here that would like to be involved in the solar industry? Okay. So... I guess everybody's watching or not watching on Facebook there. Uh, pretty much every hand went up in the room here. So get a bit of a feel for what the audience is. Um, first of all, thank you very much for letting me uh, use some of your valuable time. I know uh, your time is important, and I really appreciate you being willing to listen to me for a few minutes. Uh, I've been asked to talk about what a solar installer should do for a commercial client. And, um, you know, what does that mean? Well, for me, I think a solar installer should provide KISS solar. Keep it simple solar. Could you flip the slide for me? be awesome. But what do I mean by that? Oh, is there one before that? Ah, there we go. Well, I mean that we'd like to try to make solar simple. Solar, commercial solar, commercial rooftop solar is not actually that simple. But the point is, is that what we really want to try to do as installers is we want to try and get it to a point where it's something that a business owner can look at it, can understand in terms they, un they uh, use and to make decisions and such and actually move forward. And, you know, there's a lot of complexity behind it, but that's to me what it really comes down to. Our goal should be to try to show the value or not to the customer of putting solar on their business. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. 
All right, so that'll sort of be the theme of what I try to talk about here as we run through the slides. Um, everything's really around, does the solar work for your business? What are you going to do as the business owner? What should you be thinking about? I think in this first slide here, uh, it's probably, in fact, I'm pretty certain it would be the most common or important thing for any type of business for people to be considering, and that's to understand what is really important to your customer and how they're going to evaluate the product that you're providing to them. So in this case, you know, is the business owner who's considering solar, are they thinking about purely financial reasons? Are they thinking about sustainability goals? Are they thinking about marketing benefits? Or maybe they may even be thinking about com uh, competitive pressure. Are you competing against Facebook, Google, Apple? These guys are all either at 100% renewables or on their way. Or perhaps you're a supplier to these companies, in which case, if you're looking or forward thinking, you may realize that there may be an expectation for you as the supplier with the next logical step that you would be going solar as well, or at least to that 100% renewable solution as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so talking once more about what the installer is trying to bring to the business owner. Um, Obviously, we need to explain how solar works and how it's used by the building. And what I mean by that, where is that solar energy going? It's going into the building, it's being used on internal loads, it's going to the utility when there's excess. And we need to be able to quantify that. Safety is always a concern or a question that we see from customers. Business owners want to understand that your solar system is safe. The exciting thing is, is that there's now a whole section, or has been, I guess, for a while, but to me, the message is there is an entire section in the CEC that basically talks about the requirements of solar. We're not a bunch of yahoos out there putting solars on roofs. We're using uh, qualified, certified products, professional engineer designs, etc. And then maintenance and lifespan. There's a tendency within the solar industry, I believe, certainly on the photovoltaic side, to talk about the fact that there may be virtually no maintenance required for solar PV. But what we really want to do is we want to understand that because we have the experience and the knowledge and be able to quantify, truly quantify that maintenance cost so that it can be built into the economic models. We don't want to oversell a product to our customers. And next slide. Thank you. So David talked about this one a fair amount, but you know, really, in uh, general terms, we need to think about whether or not we have a suitable building. We have a business, we're happy, we're excited about the prospect of solar, but do we have a building that's structurally sound? I always like to say, and I think the guys and gals at our team laugh at me, but you know, is the system gonna fall through the roof, right? It really comes down to something as simple as that. What about roof condition and age? That was covered. Roof equipment, how much real estate do you actually have on that roof? Big roof, uh, you got rooftop air handling units everywhere. Maybe it doesn't viable. Electrical system, are we gonna be able to interconnect? Talked about that. And then utility interconnection concerns. This was not, I don't think, touched on really. There are certain areas within Calgary where you basically cannot interconnect a solar system. And it's not just in Calgary, there's certain areas in Edmonton as well understanding the interactions between your system and the utility and being able to convince the utility that you're able to uh, safely, effectively meet the requirements to interconnect with their system is a key piece and, it, and it's something that I think occasionally gets overlooked. Next slide. What about building ownership? Do you own the building outright? Who pays for the utilities? We have business owners, and if you end up being a tenant, how's the tenant uh, building owner relationship? Is that something that's gonna be able to support an agreement whereby you're trying to put equipment on their roof? And then what about the terms of the tenants? Are they gonna be there a while, or are they gonna be heading out shortly? So we've looked at building suitability, We've looked at the viability of the building ownership relationship. We understand what the customer or the business owner wants to see in solar. 
Uh, if we could have the next slide here. Let's talk about the key fundamental components that make up the story, or the economic component at least, of the evaluation of solar for a business. So energy production and brown energy costs. Energy production is something I think that uh, is a key, it is the key component I think of the whole uh, project. What you need to, or you know, there's a lot of data that gets pulled from a lot of, by a lot of different installers out there that's really data purely, uh, purely pulled from the web. It doesn't have any real actual data against it that's validating it or otherwise. Um, we spend a huge amount of time trying to ensure that we make that data and those numbers as accurate as possible. And in fact, we actually have people come back to us that will say, hey, it looks like you got the same size system, but your system doesn't produce as much. What are you doing wrong? And the truth of the matter is, is that in order for us to ensure that we're giving the best numbers possible to come up with the best realistic economic model, we want to spend the time and make sure those numbers are accurate. We're always out there reinvestigating our database, our install base, to ensure when we say that a system will do the, what we say, we've done everything we can to make sure that that's the case. And that's a key, key component in terms of the actual true savings. How much at what cost is what the outcome of that is. Once we understand the production, we can talk to you about what that price per solar kilowatt hour is. But we need to be able to compare that against the brown electricity cost. And David alluded to this quite a bit, so I won't touch on it too, too much. We want a simple number that we can bring to the top that we can take to the business owner to show them the value prop of solar and be able to be able to compare the two options. But honestly, I would hope that most of us know that there are a, a lot of complexities within all the different types of contracts, et cetera, that are underway when you're in a commercial arrangement. It is not simple. You can't just blanket throw a number at it. You need to look at every single scenario. It's always changing. And then my last slide here is talking about the fact that business, for business owners, solar can create value. But you need to understand and decide that the value that it creates is the right value. Does it have to have financials? And is that the only thing that it's going to stand on? Does it align with company values you already have? Does it allow you to be a, a leader in climate change solutions? Each of us have our own reasons for choosing to use solar, and it's really up to us to make that decision. It's the last slide, please. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So our next speaker, Jason Zorowski. Uh, Jason started with Equal Electric in Regina in 1989 in the warehouse before working into moving himself into industrial sales. In 2010, Jason moved to the utility group and covered all of Saskatchewan for the next two years. Then in 2013, uh, 2003, he moved to Calgary to become the utility manager for Southern Alberta. Fast forward to 2016, he moved to corporate office as the general manager for utility and also industrials for the company. From 2012 and to 2017, he also acted as the renewable energy manager. Please welcome with me, Jason. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of uh, uh, an installation of what it was a few years ago to maybe where it's going to go today. Uh, you'll see some, some major cost overruns, some uh, very bad payback, and, uh, and where it would be today. So I'm going to give you a quick overview. So first slide. Uh, just a quick thing, Eco Electric, we're a Western Canadian wholesaler. Uh, we're right across Western Canada, as you can see. And uh, this year we're actually celebrating our 100th anniversary. So it's, uh, we started in 1919 in actually Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, actually. 
I haven't been there that long, but been there, been there quite long. Anyways, uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a, a rough idea, overview of our solar system, what we did and what we were creating. Um, at the time, we were not looking for um, a payback. We were actually looking to kickstart um, Ecall Electric into the renewable energy field. Uh, we were not trying to make money off of this. This was to showcase it, uh, to bring clients in, see where the, 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 the market is going to start to go. And uh, like I said, it wasn't there to make a lot of money at the time. So we designed the system uh, in 2012. Um, that's when I started the group, uh, our renewable, renewable energy group. And like I said, it was, uh, it was a learning uh, tool for our group and everybody to, uh, to, to understand the, the challenges of actually designing a system, uh, installing a system, and then uh, seeing where it's going to go from there. So next slide, please. So we designed a 47.2 kilowatt solar array. Um, and we had a full south-facing roof. Uh, it was a brand new facility that we did build. Uh, consisted of 189 250-watt panels, and uh, like we also, like I said, we installed it in fall of 2012. It was a net metering configuration. It covered, planning was covering to about a third of our power of our facility. And on our roof, it roughly covered, uh, I'd say about a fifth of our roof. Uh, about a, and it's about, like I said, 85,000 square foot facility. Um, now this was a flat roof, and when we designed the system, uh, we wanted to go with a 30 degree angle. Uh, today, I, I do, to do a 30 degree angle today, um, it's very costly, uh, and even still today it is. Um, but when we did it then, it was extremely expensive. Um, we, today I would uh, definitely redesign it um, because we ended up with a lot of cost overruns with snow load, wind load, and, uh, and I'll explain what we have to do to our building. Next slide. So this is a picture of our facility. Um, like I said, it's, uh, it, it's, quite, it's raised quite high, and you know, you, you know our wonderful Chinook winds we get here. And when that thing comes, uh, we had to make sure that that was on the, on the mounted down pretty good, that wasn't going to blow away. So we used actually a mounting system. Next slide, please. Uh, it's a non-invasive system, so there's no penetrations in the roof. Um, but by doing that, it caused some challenges for us. Um, we ended up having to design it for 100 mile per, 100 mile per hour winds. Um, and then just to actually get the weight on that, to have it on the roof, um, we had to we used 15 pallets, about 2,250 concrete pavers, uh, to 21 pounds of, of uh, brick. So, and they, they were not fun to install either. Um, and then also the next problem we had is the, the roofing membrane. Um, we originally had a 30 millimeter uh, membrane, and to get the warranty uh, to be uh, held, up, held up, we actually had to add another 90 mils of membrane. And all that means is extra cost, extra cost. So, and when the roof was being designed, we actually had to upgrade our trusses, our footings. Uh, so like I said, the challenges that we ran into, um, our, our costs were extremely high. Next slide. So as you can see in this slide here, you can actually see the, pa the pavers that are actually holding it down. Um, there was a lot of work to, to put those things down. They were not fun. Um, we, were, uh, we were pretty sore after we got that done. So um, we actually did it in conjunction with uh, Crestview Electric and Ecall Electric uh, employees actually did the install on this. So it was uh, quite impressive, actually. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there again in 2012, um, you know, we ended up using 250-watt uh, uh, jinkle panels. Um, with that system, um, the, the panel price at that time has dropped dramatically to today. Uh, so there again, another cost that we uh, occurred. Uh, the system is configured in nine different arrays, so we have nine inverters on our roof, uh, so it's kind of broken into sort of nine little separate systems. Uh, each, each, each array consists of seven strings per panel, and uh, each string uh, consists of three panels wired together, in, wired together in series, roughly gives us about 8.7 amps at 112 volts DC. So there again, we have our, our inverters on our roof. We're actually doing our conversion on our roof before we're actually going into the building with an AC voltage. Uh, and then the, the total is seven strings at 60.9 amps, and then there again, stays, stays the same uh, voltage DC. Next slide. Combiner boxes were manufactured, so we're bringing in all the, all the panels are actually coming into a combiner box, and it's sort of like a junction box. Um, we had them designed by Merson. It was, uh, it was a kind of a unique design at the time. We actually had a shunt trip installed, and we were kind of going ahead of time because we we're using the shunt trip as an actual uh, disconnect so when actually the fire department was coming into our facility, they could actually de-energize our system at our front doors. So you could actually shut down the power of the array, 
up into the combiner box, so it was kind of a unique design at the time. Um, and there again, it, it became code in the future. Um, when, like I said, there are seven combiner boxes on a roof that goes, each, each inverter comes with a combiner box. This is the picture of the, the combiner box. And uh, like you said, there, there again, there was a DC shunt trip in there. All the, all the, uh, the, the seven strings would each, each would have one, their own box, and then you have 21 panels feeding that box. And then you're out of there, you're taking a positive, negative, and uh, you're neutral. Next page. Uh, the inverter we used, uh, it, was, it was a company called Sustainable Energy Technologies at the time. Um, the reason we chose them, it was actually a minus 40 rated inverter. So we could actually have that outside, put it on the roof, and uh, we're actually getting full production out of it at minus 40. Um, there's not a lot of manufacturers out there that actually create or have uh, inverters at minus 40. Um, so that's one of the reasons we chose them. Um, Today, there's definitely a lot more choices than uh, there was then. So like I said, it's a, it was a kind of a unique thing and they were very expensive at the time also. So another cost that went high. And they were also made in Calgary too. So, uh, and one of the joint things with them is, is they actually got to showcase it for themselves also, uh, along with uh, us having the product up on the roof for them. And then, the, like I said, the inverter uh, converted the DC to AC. Um, and we actually converted everything in single phase, 208 volt. Um, the only problem with that was this, there was another cost is we had to actually make it to three phase uh, and to 600 volts. So we had to bump it up, use a step up transformer. Uh, so there again, it's another cost that had to be absorbed. Next slide. So this just gives you a little uh, snapshot of the actual combiner boxes along with the inverters. Uh, next slide. And then off the roof, we're coming into our control room uh, where we have actually nine disconnects for each array. And then right beside it, we have actually the net metering. So it's a net metering system, um, and it was an actually, uh, NMAX come in, changed our meter out, and away we went. Next slide, and that's our front entrance. So if you actually look on the left-hand side, so what we have is actually the fire department can come in with their key. They can actually disconnect right away. They'll actually power us down within uh, about 10 seconds. They can actually de-energize our system, and away they go. They can, if they have to access the roof for whatever reason, they know it's actually de-energized to the, to the panels. Next slide. So it's just a quick snapshot. Um, this is from 2017, just to give you a rough idea of the efficiencies of the, uh, the inverters. So our inverters are running at about 94% efficiency, which is extremely well, uh, extremely good for that uh, model. Um, and then our panels are running about, uh, you can actually see per month, where actually our efficiency of our panels is running about 27. Um, in February, and of course it goes down actually, it doesn't go up, because there again, the more heat, your actually efficiencies of your panel will drop over, over uh, the hotter they get. Uh, next slide please. Uh, this slide just gives you a quick snapshot. Um, when your actually DC power is spiking, um, it, there again, it's almost going, going in conjunction with your solar, solar irradiation. So as your, your solar's coming in, you're actually, next slide. So key points to take away from our, our array was this. Our over, overall cost of just material was about $300,000. Uh, cost overruns for structural upgrades was about $50,000. Modifications for the membrane, about $50,000. This does not include labor. <clears throat> so what was done is Zcall Electric did a, a fair amount of labor. Uh, uh, and then we also had Crestview, but uh, our, Crestview also did the electrical in our facility. So it was kind of a blended amount, so we really don't know exactly what that number was. So we got a little bit of an educated guess with it. So um, Since then, next slide. Uh, since the installation, we have done absolutely zero maintenance. Um, it, to be honest with you, the system works amazing. Uh, the degree of uh, the panels at 30 degrees, almost they clean themselves. Uh, in the wintertime, when the snow comes on them like it is right now, Wait till the sun comes out, the snow slides off, it pretty much cleans the panels off, and in the summertime, rain's a great thing. So you know, it cleans them off. So we've actually done zero maintenance on our facility, and it, it works great, have done nothing to it, all we do is we showcase it. Next slide. So the roughly the payback. So at roughly, I'm just, this is just rough, nine cents a kilowatt hour, uh, we would generate about $6,100 per year. So this is roughly about 68, 1,230 kilowatt hours per year. Approximate payback, 50 plus years. So like I said, it was not done for making money. It was done to showcase. Uh, so with today's price for material installation, it would be roughly about a 10 year payback in comparison. 
So in a very short period of time of seven years, you're going from a system of 47.2 kilowatts of you know, almost 50 years to pay the sucker off to now you can do it in 10 years or less. Big changes. And uh, like I said, uh, it's, uh, if we did it today, we definitely would be doing a lot of things. A lot of things, it, it, it just it killed us. But like I said, we did it for other reasons and we didn't do it to make money. Um, I also have a, a solar array on my house. I'm, like I said, I'm a very big advocate of solar too, so I have a 4.25 uh, system on my house. Actually, I do make money on that one. So in summary, uh, the solar project, um, last slide please, uh, it was a learning experience. It gave us the working knowledge from design through installation and importantly we were able to review data, um, go through the production, produ uh, produ production potential and everything we learned we, uh, we use today in our future uh, installations that we're involved in and the coding that we do to our clients now today. So like I said, it was, uh, it was, uh, if we did it today it would be totally different. Last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now to our last speaker, Andrea Woodland. Well, Andrea has worked with IKEA Calgary for 17 years in various roles, with the last two years in the position of business navigation and operations manager. Part of her overview includes financial planning, facility maintenance, and sustainability, which all come together to support projects and in initiatives like their solar implementation. So let's please give Andrea a warm, warm welcome. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here and really sharing uh, something that we're quite proud of. Did anybody in the room know that IKEA Calgary has a full solar implementation on our roof? It's pretty positive. Um, if you haven't flown over, it is a little bit hard to see. So I've been asked, <laughs> it, it, we have a 10 degree tilt. Um, I have been asked just to come in and speak about um, our rationale and business case and why we went solar. Um, so just quickly covering IKEA and sustainability. Uh, where we are today as a company, uh, our project and investment, and then, of course, the partners that we worked with. So IKEA, a furniture store, um, also guided by a pretty strong vision of creating a better everyday life for the many people. Uh, we imagine beautiful possibility of a sustainable future, and we really do go all in to make this a possibility. Um, IKEA, the IKEA group, which is the global organization, has declared that we will be um, energy independent and produce um, enough renewable energy to offset our operations by 2020. So um, in the past few, a few years ago when we heard that, that was a really alarming statement and how are we possibly gonna do that? Uh, and just a year away, I would like to share with you where we are in Canada. So we have eight um, in installations across the country right now on um, eight of our store roofs, so just over half. In Alberta, we also own the Old Man 2 Wind Farm and the uh, Wintering Hills Wind Farm to the south and southeast of us. And there's just a nice note that um, furniture retailer IKEA, IKEA Calgary and IKEA Canada uh, have been the recipient of the Cancia Solar PV Project of the Year, as well as Solar Developer of the Year for 2018. Thank you. So just sharing with you a few of the projects that are in place. So um, you'll see a snapshot of our Burlington, Ontario store, which also uh, is where our service office or our head office is located. Ottawa, Ontario, and um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is the second newest member to the IKEA Canada family. And what you might notice is actually more of the rooftop is uh, covered with solar. And that's because every building we build now, we build with sustainability in mind. Um, so how do we get just a little bit better? Um, Halifax was our first LEED certified building, um, and now we've welcomed Quebec City just um, a few short months ago, um, also with the same certification. So new buildings are fantastic, but we also have our existing buildings that are deeply rooted in our community, so what can we do there? Um, IKEA Edmonton, uh, some of these stats they can be very proud of. It's hard uh, with our competitive nature to uh, be from Calgary, but sharing Edmonton. So. <laughs> Uh, this, the largest uh, solar project for IKEA Canada to date is actually in Edmonton with just over 2,900 panels. 
It's the second largest uh, setup in Alberta, producing just over one megawatt annually. And uh, they're actually the recipient of um, Solar Project of the Year from Kensia for last year. So congratulations, Edmonton. Here in Calgary, we do have a 20, just uh, 2240 uh, solar panels total, uh, 365 watts each, um, 10 degree panel tilt, so it's really great that uh, other experts in the industry have uh, learned those lessons. We are on a ballasted system, so uh, no roof penetrations for us, which is also um, music to anybody in the finance or facilities ears. Uh, and we have a string of 27 inverters rated at 24 kilowatts each. I'm really proud to share that actually in, in Canada, we've achieved uh, the goal of generating more alternative energy than we use by four times of our total operations. Thank you. So um, that's 14 stores, five pickup and order points, and three full-size uh, distribution centers. So extremely proud and humbling and uh, really happy to be able to share, the, share this information with the community. So why invest in solar? Um, it is, we, do, we are committed to energy independence and climate action. Uh, we would like to hedge elect electricity prices and limit future exposure on uh, price, very, price fluctuations. Eliminate those retail premiums uh, that we were paying for certainty. And of course, right now, taking advantage of the, um, the EEA rebate certainly drove our decision. So in Calgary, the investment looked like a 1.63 million in total capital. Uh, of that, we had, were actually able to get 24% rebate back from the energy efficiency rebate, which brought our return of an, on investment down to five years. Um, without, without that uh, rebate, we're actually looking for seven. So to be able to close the gap and make it a little bit more profitable and make more sense for the business, um, certainly the time is now to look into what the government and the rebates are available. We expect to see a 25% reduction in our utility cost annually, um, looking to offset at least 744 tons of CO2. And just worth mentioning that um, once, once we have our payoff, it's actually, the system is here to stay. So it's about a 30 year or more uh, life expectancy. There's a 25 year warranty on the solar modulars alone. So um, really looking forward to what we see going into the future. For the Calgary project, we partnered with Resco Energy. They have um, been a part of many of our solar in installations. They took over design and implementation. We had a project manager from um, out east, but located here for the entire project. Uh, and then we're able to hire locally for, the, for the, all of the labor and the installation, which is fantastic also for our local community. Resco also offers the ongoing monitoring and maintenance of our, of our panels and systems. Just a quick snapshot, so we have been uh, officially turned on and live uh, for the past four months. We're a direct feed system, so everything we generate uh, is coming straight into our building for use today. Certainly grateful for this lovely winter, a uh, little snow, a little, little bit of clouds here and there, but nothing, nothing short of fantastic, especially for a solar system. So um, our demand right now um, on our utility is 77% drawing in. Uh, with 23% of um, our building being powered by the solar that we're creating on the roof. And I just think it's super important to mention that um, the, the partnership and the rebate that's available right now, maybe till May, maybe longer, uh, if there's any consideration, it's certainly the time to look and see what they can offer. The, uh, the application process is extremely easy. Uh, timely response and great knowledge from the team at EEA and again, uh, the valuable rebate that could maybe be the difference between the ability to, to go ahead with a project and perhaps not being able to justify it financially. Also, uh, really great to partner with Resco. Um, they are multiple award winners. They've connected over 50 megawatts of PV, uh, 200 sites maintained. Uh, they've also connected and continue to monitor Cal Canada's largest system and it, many in-house experts, as well as the dedication to health and safety is certainly uh, something that are an, uh, 
site looks forward to. Um, a lot of the work was done when we were open, of course. Uh, open for business, we have customers, we have coworkers, so health and safety is, of course, top of mind for us. And while we went with the ballasted mount, uh, there are many op options available with the Resco team. So that is IKEA and why we participate in um, solar. Our, our culture is really built on enthusiasm, togetherness, and a get-it-done attitude. Uh, we're optimists, constantly looking for opportunities, and always willing to lend a hand. And so on that note, I just say, um, already in Europe, there are uh, residential solar systems being made available to the consumer. So not only the panel, but also the battery to hold your power. So um, stay curious, keep checking back, because we really look forward to having that in Canada and uh, making it available to more of the many people. Um, well, I'm, I'm just curious, I mean, uh, Jeff and David, you both um, uh, sort of gave us the, the doom and gloom side of the story, right? The, all the things that can make this challenging or difficult um, uh, at uh, the, the business scale, basically, the medium scale PV system. Um, but I think both of you have been, have been involved with large scale systems, including stuff on, on, on large uh, rooftops and I wonder if you could maybe share share a story or two about those and kind of how how they work out worked out financially how they worked out in terms of generation you know that that sort of thing um, if it's not an unfair question so we've gone back and looked at a number of projects that have been installed for a while and compared sort of the production with our predictions and have been fairly accurate. Um, like Jeff said, to, to get the customer an actual number when they're looking at a system, you want to be pretty accurate in your predictions. And so we've gone back and looked at it. You know, we've seen a little bit of suffering uh, over the last couple of Augusts with the fire smoke mm. uh, impacting production. So you know, it's, it's another thing to throw into the mix when you're doing your analysis. Um, adds to the cost and so you know there's generally not a lot to do once it's installed and customers are very happy with the systems I think we highlighted issues but they're just to be aware just with anything that's got a little bit of complexity to it that there's things to watch for right it's not to say that you can't do these things, and it's not to say that you can't do them and have confidence that they're going to perform, cost, behave the way that you expected them to initially. So um, there's always going to be barriers, but as an, as an industry sees more, becomes more and more established and people get more and more comfortable with it, uh, you know, it becomes easy, it gets easier and easier. And that's, that's no, not unique for solar, it's anything that's new. Uh, certainly there's utilities that we used to, you know, and, ins and inspections and inspectors that, you know, at one point they were struggling with stuff and they understand it very well now and there's no concerns and the processes are in place and things just flow. And that's just gonna continue to move forward and improve and I, I think it's, it's actually a good news story, you know, and it's just, I guess we're just trying to share that there's there's things to consider and that's it but it's actually very positive and it's a great product and solution and uh, it's crazy that not everybody's doing it how about I end there <laughs> you want to talk about yours <laughs> <laughs> involved in the solar industry, I just kind of watch, uh, observe, because I have a general interest. Um, what I am aware of in Alberta is that um, as far as uh, energy companies that actually are producing energy um, in the solar area, mainly it's like large like f installations like on land, like field 
and to my knowledge, I don't see any companies that are uh, owning and operating commercial uh, solar, like as, as an energy developer, so leasing, leasing rooftop space from a company. We saw it in Ontario, but I don't see it so much in Alberta, and I'm wondering if it's because of regulation or financing or economics, or if we're going to start seeing that, or maybe it already exists, and I just don't know about it. It's starting to happen in Alberta. Uh, one of the challenges we have is still relatively low energy prices. So if you're looking to finance a project and lease a rooftop, that sort of type of project, you know, the developer or the, the finance company is going to want, you know, 7 to 9%. Uh, in the U.S., you see quite a bit of it. There's a 30% tax credit that they can take advantage of. Our energy prices here are still low. So we're, you know, 8 to 10 cents all in for electricity. You get into Southern California, so better solar resource, 25 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity and a 30% tax credit. It makes it much more attractive for a finance company to start investing in sort of a solar rooftop lease or power purchase agreement type project. That's why we're not seeing as much going on here. With the rebates coming in, our energy prices going up, system costs coming down, we're going to start to see that happen. I don't think I can add very much to that. I think there's lots of different creative ways that are going to start, we're going to start to see here in Alberta for uh, financing or owning uh, commercial projects on roofs. Hi there. Um, from a trades perspective, uh, you, you, t you talked a little bit about the code change, um, the new codes now in effect. I haven't had a chance to see the code book. I'm just wondering how that affects the cost of the installation and does it make it easier? Or? So the, uh, it's a bit of a depends question. Uh, residential has some fairly significant additional costs that are going to be added in on the uh, system side for rapid shutdown requirements and being able to have a shutdown device by the meter. Uh, probably a couple other things that I should probably know off the top of my head that I don't, that I rely on my team to help me with. Um, but uh, on the commercial side, depending on how the install is being done, I think there's actually pretty minimal a impact from a code perspective, so it may not affect it. Uh, yeah, key thing is is that you know the code is the code. It's there for a reason. It's for safety. Sometimes we have uh, a little bit of indigestion with the way things are done. But you know the fact. How about maybe this is somewhat interesting, and perhaps everyone in the room knows this. But we're we're typically following a year behind the code that has been adopted in the U.S. Right or or more. So it, when we see these things roll into the CEC, into the Canadian Electrical Code, it's not like these are brand new things. It's not like the manufacturers haven't already seen it. It's not like um, the rest of the world, rest of North America at least, or at least, sorry, the United States hasn't already seen it, addressed it, they're bored by it, they're doing it. So typically it's going to be, I would say, probably pretty reasonable stuff that we see come into our code. And it's, you know, we, we, we manage it and we, we incorporate it into our normal installation processes. And designs. Uh, one other thing that we've seen too is, uh, depending on some of your code changes, you got to look at your uh, local inspectors. Uh, they do make some of their own choices, and uh, <laughs> and and sometimes you have to go by them. And unfortunately, if you want to get your your uh, your your array passed, you have to do certain things, and it's gonna there's some cost affiliated to that also. Uh, so it's not just maybe strictly the code book. There are some other um, hurdles you will run into. And uh, there again, it's, it's another cost and it's some changes that you have to, to look at and address as you're building your array. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a challenge when every jurisdiction has their own interpretation of the rules. Uh, if you go across the country, it varies from BC to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Uh, almost impossible to install solar in Manitoba. <laughs> it's, it's a big, big challenge there. And from jurisdiction in jur to jurisdiction in, in Alberta too, we see different interpretations of the rules. So as we you know, have built projects pretty much all over Alberta, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, you see different rules. And so best bet is to talk to the inspector, uh, local inspector, to find out what they're looking for. And, you know, a, a, as solar becomes um, 
more adopted in some of those areas, they start to look around at other rules, see what other people are doing, rather than trying to interpret it themselves, which is frustrating some days. So a lot of education of inspectors. Uh, when I put my first system in in 2001, the inspector came around, he'd never seen a solar system before. <laughs> so Calgary's actually quite good now. One of the speakers mentioned homes built before, I think it was 83 or 84, didn't have. Market buildings, primarily. Okay. Um, my question is, with these older buildings, to bolster the structure to support the solar project, um, typically, uh, how much capital investment is this? It won't project? happen. Oh. Just the capital cost to reinforce a building yeah. negates the value of putting solar on the roof. Like, what do you say, $50,000 to reinforce the trusses on the roof? And that was during construction. So to do it post-construction, it's never going to happen. Are there any cases of owners just going ahead anyway without, you know? They'll find a different place to put the solar. We do a wall mount. Uh, if the roof's not suitable, we'll go to a wall mount. Okay. I don't think we've seen one where anybody has reinforced trusses. Maybe on, unless it was a... It was a potato barn. We reinforced the roof a little bit. But generally in a commercial building, it's not going to happen. Hello. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Jason Jurovsky. Um, what energy management software do you use in your company? Uh, at the time when we built our system, uh, we actually used a, it was a, it was a brand called Carlo Gavazzi um, monitoring system. Um, since that time, it's uh, it's to be honest with you, they've kind of that they've went out of that marketplace. So, uh, so our, our actually monitoring system is really a dated system. We are actually looking at uh, and replacing it now. Um, it's it was it was kind of unique the way it would actually give the information for. Um, each panel we could actually pick off. Um, we could pick off information off of the array. Um, the strings, everything else, but uh, if since then it's uh, it's it's not do working that well right now. It's kind of actually caked on us. So that's why when I was showing some of the numbers, it was 2017, and we're looking at uh, redoing the, the monitoring system on it today. So unfortunately, it's uh, it's just an archaic system now. Okay, and I have two more questions: one for you and one for all of you. So, um, what is the overproduction of um, the your solar system installed uh, photovoltaic panels? The overall production? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, uh, the overproduction, the surplus uh, of energy from uh, the installed... Um, for our facility, system. it's covering roughly about a third of our facility for our power. Oh, so um, okay, okay. That, just a rough guess. Um, uh, so, so it's, uh, with the, so like I said, with the energy cost of nine, you know, roughly nine cents a kilowatt, uh, we're pulling in about just over $6,000 per year. Um, so that's why the payback was quite long, especially okay. with the cost that we had. Um, my residential house, um, I'm, I'm, I'm roughly covering about half my house at 4.25, um, and I'm looking to uh, actually double my system this spring um, to, uh, to get to pretty much net zero on my, on my bill. So, um, oh. so it's beneficial. You've got to look at, like I say, when uh, Dave mentioned too, is you've got to look at your installations. Uh, how are you facing? Are you, are you able to get the production off your system properly? Um, those are big, big factors when you're actually designing a system because uh, even for my house, I didn't have anybody built beside me. Now I have a house built there, and I've, it's another bungalow, so I'm, I still can have uh, no problem putting in a, more panels. If I had a two-story come in, I'm done. I, I lose my existing uh, array and anything else. So you really got to hope, like, you know, even the facility you guys were talking about in Edmonton, today you're okay, tomorrow you just don't know. So you got to look up what you're doing to see what you're going to produce. And do you think... Um Anybody or a person can uh, build, uh, can design, and um, can design uh, such a system for his house uh, alone, or he needs uh, support. Uh, like he, you he definitely can... need the support. You you need to really get somebody qualified that's uh, um, that does this, uh, that can design it. Uh, you still need to look at uh, you, you know, look at your roof, what it is, if it's an existing, uh, how old the house is. You got to look at the the roofing. Um, and you really need a qualified electrician, or you do need a qualified electrician to uh, do your interconnects. Um, so bottom line is you have to have somebody that's, uh, you just can't uh, get Joe Blow to go out there and go do it yourself as a homeowner today. At least I don't believe you should. Uh, 
Yeah, you can't even pull a whole winter's permit. So you need that qualified electrician to do your tie-in anyway. So um, at the end of the day, look for a, a qualified uh, installer um, and that, that's out there, and, and that's the way to do it. Because they're going to go around, they're going to evaluate your home, they're going to do your analysis, give you your ROI, um, and give you your complete design on it. Um, and then again, there again, when you're doing penetrations in your roof, same thing, even if it's on a residential roof, you've you got to make sure you're hitting your studs, uh, you're not making extra holes in the roof, so you know you don't want somebody who doesn't know really what they're doing to, to get up in your roof and start making holes. It's, it's just not a good thing to happen. Okay, thank you very much. And for all of you, what do you think should be done uh, in order um, the solar industry to uh, develop faster? Yeah. Now, while you guys think about it, the other thing about the installation is that there are grants available from the government, the EA, but the grants apply only if it is installed by a registered or a certified installer. If you were to install it on your own, those grants will not apply. Okay. So to the question, <laughs> how do we grow the solar industry here? So I, su I assume that was an Alberta specific question. I think that the provincial government, the NDs have done a fantastic job of supporting the renewable energy industry in Alberta. Um, their approach has been pragmatic, but they have covered all the bases, and we saw another example of it being covered tonight with the Green Loans Program. I, I think we've been super fortunate for it, and you know, Dave and I have been doing this for a while. The difference is off the chart compared to what it used to be like. So I would say that first. I would say to continue to see it grow, like there is going to be momentum, we're going to continue growing pending the election in April, but that aside, I think maybe the, the price of carbon still may not be at the point it needs to be to really drive us to that last, last piece of adoption and going up the ramp. So, you know, there's always a balancing act when you look at all the levers that you can pull, I guess, as a government, don't know, never been there, but I assume they always have to look at all the pros and cons and how things go across. They're, they are looking at, I think, increasing the tax more, the carbon tax or carbon levy, I guess they would call it. Uh, but, you know, they have to do that in a manageable, man in, a, in a controlled manner. So that would be my, my comment on that one. So one of the things the province is doing to grow the industry is to overcome, you know, one of the big stumbling blocks is, you know, I don't have five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to put into a solar system. So the PACE program is a property assessed clean energy. So today in the city of Calgary, if you want to redo your sidewalk in front of your house, you have to pay for it, but you don't have to pay for it all at once. The city will come in, they'll replace your front sidewalk if it's all cracked up. They will put the value or the loan to pay for that on your property taxes. So it follows the house for the next 20 years. So the province last fall passed legislation that will allow that property improvement to be done on the private property. The sidewalk is city property. So you go ahead, you find a contractor, you get a, a quote on your solar system, you go to the city, EEA may be running that program for some municipalities. They will arrange a loan, you're gonna pay interest on it. And it doesn't follow you as the homeowner, it stays with the house. Mm -hmm. So there's been a number of projects in the US where companies have a solar leasing program. That becomes a liability if you go to sell the house. If the next homeowner doesn't wanna take on the lease, you're on the hook for paying off the lease and having the solar system removed from the house. With the PACE program, it stays with the house and you're not on the hook for that loan. So it's, it's an interesting way to fund it, and I think it's gonna drive a lot of uh, growth in the residential solar. I, I still think one of the biggest thing is, is education. Um, you know, word of mouth. Um, we're seeing more and more code changes. We're seeing that it being adopted more, you're being taught more on the school side. Um, there again, uh, like for us ourselves, it's word of mouth. Um, you know, if you ever want to know, like I, I talk about solar all the time in my house, just getting that awareness out there to get people interested in it too. I think that's another way of seeing growth and, uh, you know, there's, you know, you, you can do a lot of different things with solar. Um, you know, like I say, even with your guys' facilities, um, you know, showcasing them and uh, getting people interested and, you know, people like yourselves coming out and trying to understand and learn about it. And, you know, eventually uh, 
you know, if it works for you and that financially if it makes sense, take the chance. Uh, it's a great thing. I, like I say, I'm enjoying what's on my house and uh, uh, I, I love doing it. So I think it's a great thing. I totally agree with you. I think that'd be a great idea to look at and, uh, you know, whether it's a joint venture with, um, you know, Solar Energy Society or something that's done, I think it'd be something to look at. Uh, and I think there again, uh, look at the changes that have happened in such a short period of time already. Uh, we still have a long ways to go. Um, uh, you, you look at the, even the solar industry, what happened in Ontario, you know, it, it, it boomed and it went fast. Well, are we where we, where we, are, we, are, where we are we at where our Ontario is? Not a chance. We're getting there. We're slowly growing. We're getting that momentum. And I, I think it's just a matter of time to, to see stuff like that and, and see more uh, joint ventures to, to, to educate it and to, to, and to show it to the public and, and get it out into the marketplace. They also offered a huge incentive program. Um, so when you're when you're giving back 84 cents a kilowatt hour, um, I'm sorry, anybody's going to do that. Um, so like I say, are we at that point? No, um, uh, you know, no, and 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 we're be, we're succeeding at that. And, and you look at even uh, for example Germany, they're the world leader in in solar over the years. They do it now, and there is no incentive program. That that's gone now. It did get it to get it, it sort of kickstarted. It's it's gone now. They and they're they're succeeding at it. So. There again, do we need to be at 84 cents a kilowatt to, to try and get this program working? No, we're making it work with what we have right now and, and it's, it's succeeding and it's growing. Eventually, is that going to disappear? Possibly uh, in time, but it's going to be able to, you know, the power rates are going to go up. It's, it, it makes it more achievable and uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's going to be a win-win for everybody. Just we're still in the infancy stages. I think you guys covered a lot of it. Uh, for me, um, personally, it's just more about awareness and understanding the, the, the possibilities out there. So we have, you know, experts right here in our own city. Um, and it's just making sure that we're connecting with the right people to understand. And then constantly going back and relooking. Um, we mentioned even five years ago, solar was out of reach for, for mm -hmm. the IKEA building, for example. And now, um, now we can do it. Uh, and we've done it. Um, so awareness and also just lobbying for that change um, because there are still uh, hurdles to get through with certain utilities, utilities certain jurisdictions, sorry. Um, so just lobbying for that diversification change and, and making sure our government and our cities know that that's what we want to do and the way that we need to go. Good point. Any questions? Yep. Um, and Thank you for all for the presentations. Uh, Jason told that uh, the price of the project, uh, the payback time for the project was um, 50 years and now it's 10 years. And my question is what uh, caused this um, uh, improvement? Was it the technology or, uh, technology or it's now more popular, more demand for it? And does it mean that uh, for um, average uh, level income people, they should wait two, three more years to have solar? Or because if it uh, comes down this much uh, quickly, it may uh, uh, be better in two, three years. Uh, some, I guess the biggest change for us on our facility when we did it, we did a 30 degree angle. Uh, today we definitely would not do a 30 degree angle. We would do similar to what they've done as, as a 10 degree angle where you don't have to upgrade the trusses and footings. You could have used your existing uh, structure. Uh, that, that's a huge thing. That, that cost overrun right there, it, it just killed us. Um, so like I say, the, the technology now, the, the racking systems that are our, now are a lot more lightweight. Uh, what we have is we, we pretty much have a, you know, it's, it's a tank on our roof. It, it, it's I'm, I'm, it is. It's it's not going anywhere. Our building will get moved before that uh, rail ever get moved. So <laughs> it, it's it. The changes have happened. There's a lot lightweight. There's a, the technology so much better on just the, the structural uh, uh, racking systems now. Uh, there again, also the panel 
panel pricing we paid back in 2012. Um, well, today we're, uh, we're probably four times to five times less of what it was then to what it is now. So like I said, it just overall cost of, of panels, your, your, your structural side of it, uh, the membrane, uh, everything else that went on. Um, today, like I said, we would be totally doing it differently. Um, and second part of your question, um, I, I guess at the end of the day, when we, um, would, your, would, your, would your pricing change uh, go up more? Yeah, there's a possibility, and we're seeing some of that right now. And the reason what's happening is, is there's been some tariffs uh, in, 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 imposed on some of the material. So we've had some products that come from other countries, and now we're getting penalized for that. Um, and so, you know, your, your price per watt of a panel used to be this. If you buy it from XYZ country, guess what? It's going to go up. So, uh, you know, trying to buy, you know, Canadian-made, uh, North American-made, uh, you pay a little bit more than you do from some other, some other areas, but you also get penalized sometimes too. So you got to really watch where you get the, where material is coming from nowadays, um, because you get penalized for it. So, are your prices going to come down anymore? To be honest with you, I, I don't see them coming down much more. They're they're driven down pretty hard right now. Uh, you know, from your all your balance of system, your racking to your panels, it's pretty low. If anything, to be honest with you, I can see prices start to go up uh, just with material costs, your aluminums, your steel. Uh, anything that's involved in it, we're not seeing pricing go down right now. We're seeing pricing go up. So if anything, your price per watt might go the other way, not down anymore. So, so Jason, what products do you have at Ecol that only go down other than solar? Yeah. <laughs> right now, nothing. Yeah, so I, I say that to make, to make a point, right? So I, I worked in, I'm not in the trades. I'm just a dumb engineer, but I worked in with other trades with our company when we were starting we were beyond just PV solar and you know it was a, a known fact that equipment was going to always go up in price it never came down the only trade around that that happens with or the only area that that happens with is solar and it's being driven by technolo technological innovation of course and that's fantastic but at some point we're going to beat the price down to a point where it may just not continue diving more it may, but as Jason's just saying, like he mentioned modules, but we're seeing it on inverters right now, right? Where we're seeing the tariffs uh, for product that even though it's not coming through, or you would think that it's not actually, it doesn't have anything to do with the states, we're still getting dinged with uh, tariffs on Chinese-made uh, inverters, for example. So prices are going up. Maybe we see something more like this. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we see something more like this now versus that. Maybe we have some new small incremental technological advantage or uh, innovation that comes and helps us go down again. But I think things are pretty good, and the best part is the numbers make sense now. So it's 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 exciting. Just add one more thing. As of July 31st, you all know the tariffs kicked in, and I don't you know Dave and everybody can attest this. Uh, any racking that comes out of the U.S., you pay a deadly tariff for it, and uh, that, that has to be passed on. It's it's and we don't see that up front. It comes after the fact and. There, it's, it's, a, it's a huge cost right now, and you have to build that in. So it's, it's not like it used to be. So it might go away, but not right now. Hmm. Even if the aluminum or steel products are not coming out of the U.S., the prices have gone up because the manufacturers can. <laughs> <laughs> Quick question. Do businesses look into... Uh, selling the environmental attributes or renewable energy credits that are um, produced uh, from the solar installation to improve the economics of the project? So if you participate in the Energy Efficiency Alberta Solar Grant Program, that program owns the attribute, so you cannot sell it. If you had installed it prior to, uh, you could potentially sell the attributes. And would uh, in that uh, second case, would that make a significant significant difference? The grant makes a bigger difference, so people take advantage of the grant mm -hmm. rather than doing it without the grant and selling the credits. Thanks. Thanks very much for your time tonight. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, so, a couple questions from a business standpoint. You know, businesses are always looking of where do they put their capital and how can they get the best return for it. And so when I listen to your payback numbers and, and that premise of, you know, when do you break even, my appreciation for ROI is basically that. It's when does that initial capital actually 
hit pay dirt and I break even on that first investment. But it's not accounting for what I would call as like an NPV, which is what businesses will approach it by, which is that if I've got a million dollars today and I'm going to go invest it somewhere, I expect to gain a return on that, not just break even in five or ten years. I can put that million dollars somewhere else and gain a return. Is that part of the calculations you do for clients or for businesses, and do you see that as an important part of uh, an important part of the acceptance for solar right now? There's a lot of assumptions when we're doing the calculation, so it's it's difficult. So when you use when you generate electricity on a solar system, you use it in the building, it's worth the retail rate of electricity, transmission, variable portion of distribution and local access fee. If I'm producing more than I need during the day, I export that energy, it's only worth the retail portion of that energy cost. So I need to know your load profile, mm -hmm. which is not always apparent. Um, most people don't have minute by minute logging of their load in the building. We also need to know what the price of energy is going forward. Alberta's had some fairly fluctuating energy prices. Uh, we've seen energy um, in the 15 cent a kilowatt hour range back in 2013. We saw it drop down into two and a half cents a kilowatt hour uh, in the last couple of years. It's starting to rise back up again. So you need to know all those things. The payback on the solar system is based on the value of energy we're displacing. So it can be worth retail, it can be worth all of the four variable pieces, and it's also dependent on the energy price going forward. So it's a very, very difficult thing to predict. And we typically don't give a customer you know, that long-term outlook. Mm -hmm. What we can do, and the number that we can give a customer is you know, first year return on investment because we know what the price of energy is this year and we can kind of guess at their export versus internal use. What we do give a customer is a levelized cost of energy. So we know the, s the cost of the solar system. We can pretty accurately predict the energy production from the solar system. And so by looking at cost over 25 years, and bringing it all back to today's dollars, divided by the energy production over 25 years, you can gain a, a levelized cost of energy that you can then compare with what you're paying for today and what you expect to pay in the future. Right now in Alberta, levelized cost of energy from a decent solar system, so not something on the north side of the house or anything, but a, a decent roof, either commercial or residential, is cheaper than grid power. We're there. So you have to buy energy. What's the cheapest way for you to buy energy? And looking at, including financing costs on this solar system, it's cheaper to do it with solar today than it is to buy it from the grid. So where would be the right resources you'd point people to that are going to do that test on a, from a business perspective to be able to go and find good models? Like what I really appreciated tonight was the commentary about the install cost, the all-in cost is far more than just going out buying cables and, and a panel. There are real world conditions and while they can't all be perfect, for the general public or for businesses to go out, make some reasonable assumptions and run through some models. Are there some particular resources you'd point to to say these are really well accomplished and being able to give you a balanced real world view of what that cost is and, they pay, and that payback? So I would answer David's question quite, or response is different than I would give. First of all, I'd say 100%, I wanna show you an investment comparison so that you can rub it up against how else you can spend that million dollars. Right. That's, that's what that's, we need to do. That's what I'm asking. Absolutely. And the right. model that we use to do that, that's our job to come up with it. And then it's our job to convince you that the variables and inputs we've used on that model are realistic and you're comfortable with them. And then we go from there and you can decide if it's a good investment or not. Does that exist somewhere today? We do it all day, every day, all the time. And so Frank where, where is that, uh, and, and maybe offline I can get this from you, <laughs> is, is, I, I'd like to know is, is there... Oh, sure, sure. And they'll, both, I mean, they'll both show a rate of return that yep. we believe with okay, the variables great. that we would show, right? Super. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to be conscious of time. We've just hit a nine o'clock mark. Now I know I do know that the session is up to nine. So maybe one last question. I have three questions. So. Oh, you got three questions. Yeah, sure. okay. um, Keep it short then. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, they should be short. Yeah, I hope so. 
Um, so two for Dave. Um, can you give a specific example of a project that actually could uh, was eligible for the CCA tax uh, reduction? Or so I think the Brooks project was eligible. Oh, that one. Okay. Um, we haven't had any commercial rooftop under microgen. It, it's pretty difficult to qualify. Right. Yeah, energy production has to be your business mm -hmm. in order to qualify for that, for that one, grant. Yeah. And on the pay side, have you guys heard anything new about Calgary? Because last I checked, we were at square one. We I haven't heard new. anything new on Calgary. Okay, so it's the same. Uh, and my third question is for Jason. Was there any particular reason you guys used a single phase inverter in the project? Main reason was is we decided to go with a sustainable energy oh, okay. uh, with our inverters because they were Calgary made. Fair That's enough. why. I yeah. kind of figured that. That's the only right. reason why. Right. Yeah. Right. Nowadays, we like I say, we would use something totally different. Right, okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. One last question? Yeah. Sure. I've been saving this. Um, <clears throat> I've no I noticed kind of a running theme through m your presentations that <clears throat> solar in the solar energy industry is growing. It's speeding up. You're you're getting you're seeing big changes and you're seeing them faster and coming faster and <clears throat> and bigger. <clears throat> um, and of course. At least some of the some of the motivation for getting into solar, I, I'd imagine, is the environmental impact, the the effect, the uh, hopeful effect on climate change. So, I'm so I'm curious to what if when you you guys think the solar energy industry will grow to the point where it's affect where it's seri where it's having a noticeable impact on the pace of climate change and if it that'll happen you know, before or after say there's no longer you can, you can't go out to canmore to for to ski re reliably in the winter or before the Athabasca glacier melts away and we have to import drinking water from somewhere else or before there's or where there's no longer enough arable land in the world to support eight plus billion people just curious whether, when you think we'll hit the timeline on that. I don't know, but <laughs> definitely 100% I got into this business because you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And for us, for me, for my family, we chose to go into solar or into renewables because that's the way that we can be part of the solution. A very, 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 very small part, but we're taking action. Uh, are we in time and are we going to be able to do enough to make a change and change and impact it? Don't know, but that's not a reason not to try. And certainly we're not the only ones. If you look at the Alberta Electric System queue right now, so this is companies that have gotten on the queue to build projects, generation projects. So to give you an idea, Alberta has about a 16,000 megawatt generation pool. We have an 11,000 megawatt load. Right now in the ASO queue, there's over 4,000 megawatts of solar projects and 9,000 megawatts of wind projects. So there's other people excited about this as well. Well, with that, this concludes the seminar today. So again, we welcome your feedback. So really, if you have not had a chance to fill up the survey,